uh, interesting talks every week. Uh, and we have curated talks from experts in their own field. And uh, week after week, we try to kind of bring about interesting material for all the physios, clinicians, and academicians alike. So today's talk is uh, very unique. We have Dr. Madan Ramnathan, who is a team physiotherapist with the Northampton uh, County Cricket in the UK. He is there with us today for a talk on uh, the management or the problem solving of the complex shoulder. We have with us panelists along with uh, Dr. Madan, who is who are equally uh, experts in their own field. We have Dr. Gaurish Kinkre. Uh, he's a certified Bobat therapist from WRC, WCRC South Africa. He's done his motor learning from Sydney, Australia. He has completed his advanced Bobat training in Porto Alegre in Brazil and is also a credential expert in McKenzie as well as Mulligan. He's presently working as a chief rehab consultant at the Spine Rehab Clinic in uh, Lilavati and Breach Candy Hospitals. He is a director of the rehab team of India and he's the HOD of the physiotherapy department at Fortis Hospital in Kalyan. He's a consultant with the Indian Council of Medical Research, ICMR, and the Bone Health Clinic, and he's also a consultant with IIT Indore. The second panelist that we have is our very own alumni, uh, Dr. Tariq Sheikh, who is a sports physiotherapist. He has more than 17 years of experience on and off the field. He established the iPhysio, and which has three physiotherapy centers in Baner, Koregaon Park, and Navi Pate. He's also a consultant a therapist for the Kerala Blast, Blaster, sorry, uh, FC in ISL, uh, the Patna Pirates and the Delhi Dabang in the Pro Kabaddi League. He also was the consultant for Northeast Warriors in Premier Badminton League, the Indian National Under-19 Badminton and Senior National Kabaddi Junior Team. Uh, he's also associated with the NK, NKBA as well as the AK Tennis Academy and the Maharashtra under 13 and under 15 basketball. I welcome the main speaker and both the panelists today for the talk. Uh, I will now hand over the session to Dr. Gaurish Kenkre to please introduce our main speaker for, for the afternoon. Over to you. Thank you, ma'am. It's actually a privilege to introduce uh... Dr. Madan Ramanathan, because I had a small uh, this thing with him in Bangalore last time when we had met and I have heard him talk and I'm actually looking forward to hearing from him. In fact, his introduction was so big that I can actually complete one of my sessions in that much time. But because of the limited time allotted, I had to break down his introduction. So before wasting time, I would like to introduce our eminent speaker for the day. Dr. Madan Ramanathan. His achievements are beyond horizon and the list of his accomplishments hold lengths to cover up the encyclopedia. In order to elucidate his milestones, I would like to touch upon his journey so far. To begin with Dr. Madan, his academic qualifications, he has completed his postgraduate certification in musculoskeletal postgraduate diploma in physiotherapy in 2002, University of Otago, New Zealand. Certificate in orthopedic manual therapy 2002, University of South, South Australia. He has completed his Bachelor of Physiotherapy from India, MGR University, Chennai. He has also established his expertise in different equipments and modalities in physiotherapy. He is a trainer for TECAR, Win back UK, as well as Shockwave Trainer. Dr. Madan is a recognized member of Northamptonshire County Cricket UK, member of Chartered Society of Physiotherapists, Chartered Society in Sports Medicine and Acupuncture Association. Dr. Madan has also added precious jewels in his diadem by Achievements as a consultant physiotherapist at Symbiosis Medical Center, Mediclinic Hospital, Dubai. He was the deputy head of sports and, medic and medical center 
Sir H N Reliance Foundation Hospital, Mumbai. He was a musculoskeletal therapist at IPRS UK. During this ongoing professional journey, Dr. Madan has added a mem uh, added a member of uh, added a lot of feathers in his cap by contributing to the upliftment of his profession with research work on. low back pain in master athletes doing a lot of presentation stress fracture management in fast bowlers rehab from walking to running current concepts of acl rehab us guided uh, injections in sports medicine hamstring injury and prevention rehab of throwing shoulder and management of sports injuries so actually looking forward to hear from you dr madan good luck for your talk thank you uh we can't hear you you may have to unmute yourself dr madan uh, you may have to unmute yourself Dr. Madan. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear? Yes, we can. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, sorry about that, guys. Uh, I'm honestly overwhelmed by the uh, introduction given by Gurish. I'm not that big of a guy. I'm a very simple uh, a physio with a lot of passion towards my work, and uh, each and each and every day, uh, every patient I see, I I learn something new, and. Uh, the the important thing i realized in the last uh, 23 years of in the professional journey is i still need to learn a lot and i still don't know a lot of things so whatever i am throwing at you today in this talk is just something that i kind of uh, getting grips with and uh, understanding uh, of uh, on these things myself uh, at the same time as you know it's it's a journey and uh, learning never stops in um, in any profession so i'm not really uh, a big fan of uh, big words so thank you gaurish and uh, everyone for uh, throwing me so many accolades but uh, some of them uh, yeah it's it's nice to hear those things but uh, i still have a long way to go in my professional journey uh, the idea of uh, this talk is to talk about uh, problem solving sh shoulder because shoulder is one of the joints that we commonly see uh, in everyday practice and often uh, as no matter uh, what level of experience you have in your in your professional journey it is always a joint that throws conundrums and and challenges to get a complete uh, rehabilitation so without further ado uh, hold on okay okay this is uh, i've been a part of northampton cricket since 2010 and uh, happened to just brush shoulders with some uh, some big international stars but anyway that's uh, past the present is i'm still a part of northampton county cricket enjoying the journey so far uh, so it's it's nice to be involved in elite sport which you learn a lot uh, about everything uh, from uh, yourself as well as managing every complex problems that you face um i have a couple of disclosures to make uh, considering that i'm just going to say a few things about those things in the talk uh just to make people realize that i'm a consultant for winback uh, tech art therapy uk i'm one of the lead trainers uh, train uh, various football clubs and uh, when they buy winback so uh, the reference to tech art means that i have a little bit interest in it at same time i see clinically it's a very valuable tool to use as well as a similar uh, thing with uh, shockwave uh i'm with uh, working with uh, a lead trainer called mr binay matthew he's a very well known uh, speaker in hip and uh, shockwave and i'm one of the trainers uh, work for us uh, group uh, with a company called win healthcare and i'm an independent sports and msk consultant uh, apart from my uh, duties with uh, northampton county cricket um, i always say if you can't explain it simply you don't understand it well enough and this holds very true uh, with regard to any patient any conditions you treat and uh, unfortunately one of my key thing to i say to my patients is if you can't explain if i can't explain your symptoms to you and why that happening uh, probably i'm not the right guy to treat you so you might probably have to see somebody who would be able to explain it well enough and uh, one of the things i've learned in my professional journey is it's important to explain things to your patient uh, everyone thinks shoulder is very complex i personally beg to differ it ain't that complex if you can keep things simple in your head um 
from a point of view, I don't want to bore you to death with what we talk about in terms of normal anatomy and uh, go in detail of each and every joint. At this level, uh, with your training, you should know these things by yourself. But structurally, we have uh, four, what is it, three physiologic, uh, three, uh, three structural joints, which, in, which is acromioclavicular, sternoclavicular, and uh, glenohumeral joint. And functionally, you have a scapulothoracic joint. This uh, entire group uh, forms the shoulder complex. Uh, as we know, the articulation is between clavicle, uh, scapula, and humerus, and uh, one physiological joint where the entire girdle articulates with your rib cage. Uh, we call it a scapulothoracic joint. So what we don't know, we know all the lovely Grace Anatomy books with regard to the shoulder anatomy. However, what we don't know is what is the in vivo anatomy of the shoulder, and what is the in vivo anatomy of the rotator cuff. What is rotator cable, which we don't talk about much in normal clinical practice? What is rotator interval? And what is the sonographic anatomy? The reason I'm talking about sonographic anatomy here itself is I think uh, the way forward in, in three to five years time, I'm sure many physios in India would pick up uh, POCUS uh, MSK ultrasound as a part of their uh, uh, skill set. And uh, shoulder is one of the joints that that very if you, when, when trained well, you would be able to do a uh, point of care ultrasound scan on the shoulder uh, to understand the in vivo anatomy of the rotator cuff, rotator cable, and uh, different shoulder pathologies you might come across in your practice. So it's important to talk about sonographic anatomy. So I've thrown a few lovely, beautiful slides here. So as we all know, in, in Gray's anatomy, every muscle has a fixed at points of attachments. Uh, the proximal attachments, we call them origin. The distal attachments, we call them insertions, but in, in reality, in, in, in human body, nothing is uh, kind of uh, just fixed points. It's, it's a continuous uh, tissue continuum, and the tissue continuum blends with uh, the, uh, the periosteum, uh, the ligaments, the, the muscular tissue, and the muscular tissues at the end attachment, when they get, become uh, capsular, they attach into, blends into the, uh, into the tenderness uh, structure of the muscle. So when, when you cadaveric open a shoulder, you would see a shoulder like this. You won't see a shoulder with a clear attachment of a supraspinatus, a clear attachment of an infraspinatus. In this picture, you could clearly see, even though after all the dissections, you could expose some amount of uh, uh, attachment sites a little more precisely, but you can see a blending area that happens as a part of things. The main thing I'm going to focus on, rotator cuff anatomy, uh, which is important to know when you uh, understand your shoulder because 80 percent of the problems you face in your in your shoulder joint is rotator cuff pathologies um, again as you know in this picture i've just given you four views one is an anterior view of the shoulder another one is reflecting uh, the coracoid process and just only exposing supraspinatus infraspinatus alone uh, over the uh, humeral head and the third one is the posterior view of the shoulder with supraspinatus uh, under, under fibers of uh, the spine of the scapula dissected, infraspinatus and teres minor that blends uh, to form what we call the posterior cuff complex. And when you reflect everything out and then you are um, exposing three major structures, uh, one is your uh, coracoacromial ligament, which is forms of what's a, a arch uh, over the top of the shoulder and you have a dorsal coracohumeral ligament and you have a ventral coracohumeral ligament and with a thickened uh, bit central coracohumeral ligament and uh, a little bit exposure of posterior superior uh, glenohumeral ligament. Uh, again, when you look across the shoulder from a lateral view, this is what you see. The supraspinatus has, if you see the attachment, the attachment of supraspinatus is from anterior uh, to posterior, it attaches to the superior facet and the middle pass facet of the greater tuberosity. And from there on, it just blunts with the fibers from infraspinatus to form a continuous arch. Uh, the tendon attachment around the greater tuberosity is important to know because that's what you're gonna see when you do a uh, POCUS scan of your shoulder as a part of your diagnostic uh, skill set. When we speak, speak about rotator cable, the, the part where the whole ligamentous complex blends and around the, from this uh, greater tuberosity to the, uh, all the way to the posterior part, it forms a concentric thickened structure that blends in with the ca capsule. We call uh, this as a rotator cable and it's a very major structure because the rotator cable acts as a, as a structure that holds uh, the rotational torsion of the humeral head uh, in, inside the glenoid and it's reinforced by, as you see here, you have the 
superior laterally uh, you have supraspinatus and anteriorly you have subscapularis comes and blunts with and infraspinatus fibers comes and blunts at the at the posterior part of it to form a nice cable structure with again reinforced by coracohumeral ligament uh, and and the, and you see the long head of biceps tendon is intraarticular but uh, extra synovial it just uh, pierces through the gap in the rotator cable to go further up so it's important to understand rotator cable because many pathologies when the rotator cable gets affected the shoulder becomes unstable and that some of this instability is more physiological or micro instability than macro instability you see in a traumatic scenario then the next stru structure we talk about is, is a structure what we call is a rotator interval it's nothing but the physiological space that formed between uh, over the top end of the humeral head intraarticularly uh, where you, you see a gap between the supraspinatus and the subscapularis muscle uh, opens up where in the middle of it you could see uh, the biceps pulley that enters into the shoulder joint uh, to attach into the supraglenoid tubercle. Uh, it is an important uh, space to see it because the rotator interval is super, superficially reinforced by uh, coracohumeral ligament in this thing. You can see the coracoid process exposed but the coracohumeral ligament is probably not visible at this stage but the coracohumeral ligament is uh, at the posterior part of uh, the structure. Biceps pulley, again, it's one of the important uh, structure to understand. Uh, it's a stabilizing sling for the long head of biceps and it's predominantly get affected in throwing shoulders. So most of the shoulder injuries in throwing shoulders with biceps involvement involves biceps pulley and it's when the biceps pulley gets involved, it becomes more niggly nagging anterior shoulder pain, especially predominantly you see in, in, in overhead athletes. The superior and inferior glenohumeral ligament complex. When you look across this picture, you could see that they actually form a continuous link along with the rotator cable uh, and over the over the glenoid to to form a, a complete a concentric circle around the top of the humeral head. So try to visualize the image from you are looking from the top of uh, the humeral top of the shoulder just uh, at the transverse view. And if you look up from the toy, the glenoid is exposed and you could see the whole ligament complexes in, in continuum. So nothing is a separate structure that you see, you see or read in your, in your anatomy textbook. Both the superior uh, ligament complex is involved in overhead sh shoulder athletes in terms of shoulder injury. And when this ligament complex is compromised, you develop impingement problem, which is more internal impingement problem of the shoulder, as well as the rotator interval uh, is quite involved in adhesive capsulitis. And one of the things we see sonographically when we scan a patient with adhesive capsulitis is thickening around the rotator interval with the thickened uh, coracohumeral ligament complex, as well as the the ant ventral part of the coracohumeral ligament, uh, sorry, the, the glenohumeral ligament uh, uh, complex as well. So again, as I said, coracohumeral ligament is one of the major anterior stabilizing structures and it provides stability to the anterior shoulder and uh, it, it reinforced by the dorsal coracohumeral ligament and ventral coracohumeral ligament, thereby it's providing more of an antero superior stability uh, for the shoulder joint especially the glenohumeral joint. So if I take everything, all the bone out in the top picture, the picture A, you could see, could imagine, see how the ligamentous complex is reinforcing and forming a complete, a, com a complex sac-like structure where you're pretty much your glenoid, your humeral head sits inside it and gets reinforced into working in order for the, uh, for the humeral head to move inside the glenoid cavity in the, in the, in the technically more than 360 degree rotational uh, mobility in anything. And as you, we all know, anatomically and physiologically, the shoulder joint is one of the most mobile joints in the body. Um, again, uh, from a point of view, if I just take a cross section and look at the uh, shoulder joint from the front, you could see if I, scan this is an important image to understand so the long head of biceps is in the floor of uh, the bicepital groove the lateral part is the greater tuberosity and the medial part is your lesser tuberosity where deeper in the lesser tuberosity you have the glenohumeral ligament attachments uh, all the way up to the top of the surgical neck of the humerus and on top of it the supraspinatus the subscapularis comes and reinforces it on the lateral part you have the 
supraspinate is getting reinforced and the whole structure in, in here, you can see a, a kind of a concentric uh, a cable structure, we call it as a rotator cable. So it's very, very important to understand the, the importance of rotator cable as well as the rotator interval, because whenever there is a shoulder pathology, these two structure, these two mechanisms get dysfunctional. When I say it ain't that complex, this is a reason why if you can keep to a simple hypothetical directive reasoning uh, from that, as well as what we call it as an um, uh, using the clinical reasoning process, you can unsolve the complexity of the shoulder joint by prioritizing uh, the complexities in, in terms of treating and managing the shoulder joint. And uh, in my clinical experience, often we only look at across the glenohumeral joint predominantly. We don't tend to look at the contribution that comes from the sternoclavicular joint, neither the scapulothoracic joints in terms of how efficient or what is the contributing factor to the patient's uh, uh, shoulder pain as well as uh, mobility dysfunctions in, in these patients. Uh, so it's important to understand and develop a good clinical reasoning process and try to develop this inductive and directive reasoning skills in order for you to problem solve a complex shoulder. And as you know, believe me, it's a very easy process once you get these principles in your head. Uh, clinical reasoning itself is a is a one day lecture with with we can go through role modeling and we can go through case scenarios to improve your clinical reasoning process but that's not the scope of this talk when it comes to in terms of shoulder it's important to understand the differential diagnosis i'm not going to brush too much on red flags i expect you guys to know the red flags in terms of shoulder the predominant red flags are usually a major trauma uh, left-sided shoulder pain, often you need to rule out the cardiovascular causes or particularly uh, angina pectoris could refer to it, which is a serious red flag. And, uh, you know, cervical canal stenosis can uh, lead to sure, bilateral shoulder pathologies that could mimic like a musculoskeletal pathologies with tingling and numbness and bilateral arm pain. Neoplasms, there you need to understand that uh, cancer and night pain uh, could be red flags. Uh, they are red flag as well as referred from uh, pain from aortic aneurysm can refer to the shoulder or subphrenic or subdiaphragmatic irritation can refer to the thing, which is uh, again a major, uh, you need to exclude those things. So understand the differential diagnoses around the shoulder. Uh, I always use this analogy. Think about the shoulder, the glenohumeral joint is a golf ball on a golf tee and uh, the ball is bigger than the the socket like in the golf uh, the, the ball is bigger than the tee but still stay stable when you keep it not moving and uh, if you think about my analogy on uh, rotator cuff and rotator cable and uh, and rotator interval and the reinforcing ligament and imagine the three dimensional uh, sac that covers over it if you know if the glenoid is fixed with, through the bone you could see this ball can spin in any directions within the shoulder. And that's what gives the mobility and, and the, and the uh, ability of our able to get our arm into different, our hand into different positions. The entire function of the shoulder, which we don't often not think about, is ability to space your hand in space in various spots. And that is the whole purpose of shoulder having that much amount of mobility. Uh, in order to achieve us to function in anywhere in the spear in front, the spear in the side or the spear overhead or the spear, spear behind our back or reaching, pulling, pushing task that you can keep your hands in space in various directions. Just keep that simple image in mind. The entire purpose of the shoulder joint is to facilitate the hands can be in various parts of the space in order for us to achieve functional tasks. Uh, so the common pathologies you see is in terms of traumatic nature is usually fractures and dislocations, which we are not gonna cover. And the atraumatic shoulder problem is usually rotator cuff related shoulder pain. That is what you see predominantly in your practice. And uh, in terms of throwing or sporting shoulders, you see uh, impingement uh, problems. That impingement could be external impingement, which is usually uh, contribute to your sub subacromial pathology, while the internal impingement contrib contributes to throwing shoulder problems. And in in older age group, you develop uh, issues with uh, capsular dysfunction leading to aggressive uh, capsulitis, uh, causing addition of the shoulder. And we call this uh, clinically as adhesive capsulitis. So the clinical history is very important, is to understand and characterize the pain. The location of the pain will give you the indication where it is. The night pain, usually an indication that it's an, there's an underlying inflammatory process going on. Weakness all, also indicates that that could be uh, 
a structural disintegration deformity definitely indicates that it is a serious pathology and again when we talk about instability which we could cover as one single topic by itself uh, general instability it could be just a directional specific instability or multi-directional instability that you see in uh, in hypermobile shoulders or people with uh, endless uh, Dan Dan Dallas syndrome and uh, people with uh, collagenous uh, dysfunctions um, and again, some some hypermobility or uh, is is generated by sport specific uh, activities. Locking, clicking, clunking could be one of the commonest uh, clinical symptoms your patients would come across. And often Im important to understand what the previous treatment the patient had, and you want to know the uh, exacerbating as well as. Uh, uh, or uh, alleviating symptoms for the shoulder and also understand is the, is the symptom is acute or chronic in nature if it acute or sometimes it could be an acute episode over a chronic condition and uh, again also important to get a good history uh, or her story to understand whether it's a traumatic or overuse in nature and uh, if they have a previous injury it's very important to know the history of previous injury in simple terms, if you want to keep a simple uh, algorithm or, or view in your head, anybody below 35 years, we often tend to say that it's in instability with rotator cuff pathology. Anybody ab above 35 years, it could be rotator cuff pathology with capsulitis and osteoarthritis. That's the simplest way to think about it. And anybody below 20 involved in sporting uh, thing, it could be, uh, the again, again, uh, it's a continuum of uh, instability. So think about age, occupation of the patient, if they have previous uh, medical conditions. One of the things that we know that people with diabetes uh, and thyroid dis uh, disorders, these people would show adhesive capsulitis as well as rheumatoid arthritis can manifest as bilateral shoulder pain. Pre-existing uh, pain condition is also a ca cause for poor outcome for the treatment. Mechanism of injury will give you a clear indication is it a single structural uh, uh, involvement or multiple structural pathology, as well as the pain symptoms, the night pain, uh, along with uh, un what's unrelenting night pain could be a serious pathology, whereas just a dull aching night pain where that can be managed with analgesics uh, could be a rotator cuff syndrome, and uh, as well as pain with overhead activities uh, is important to know these things. And again, uh, in this slide, I've put some evidence behind each and uh, every uh, level of evidence for each uh, sub indications just for you to understand and again when when you have a loss of room or range of motion it often indicates that there could be a capsulitis underlying uh, with uh, instability as well and uh, unfair avoidance so from a physical examination point of view it's very important to uh, use your clinical skills i always say observation is general inspection is specific so general observation would give you a good indication about uh, the the alignment of the shoulder girdle the alignment of the glenohumeral joint the position of the arm held uh, when they when it's in dependent position and is there any guarding or fear uh, any guarding or passively patient trying to protect their shoulders uh, and the next step is i always go range of motion first before palpation simply because I just want to know uh, how the patient is able to move without you influencing the tissues by touching them. And uh, strength testing and special test uh, I use as a part of my continuum. Again, the bottom line question is doing all these things, where are you going to go? You, what is going to happen is, is all you're going to use your clinical reasoning process at the background in each step of your uh, thing and your physical examination always remember is only an addendum to a very good subjective examination or his or her story taking so it's very important to take a very good history in my clinic when any patients my way of dealing with this is i would spend easily about 15 to 20 minutes uh, taking a really good history and in this history includes in my expression it's more kind of a conversation rather than actually direct question towards the patient. And I try not to prompt the patients as much as possible. And I want them to come out and talk about their pain and talk about how the pain started, what made the pain worse, what they think could be contributing to the pain. Just want them to give me, because 80% of them, when you listen to a patient, you are not only getting a good indication about what is the pathology, also you're getting a good indication is what's going to work from a treatment point of view and what don't go, what's not going to work from a treatment point of view. So my, uh, and as you know, most uh, 
uh, senior clinicians are very good and most uh, efficient clinic clinicians are extremely excellent history takers and uh, their ability to take history and ability to generate and uh, and uh, cons uh, condense information out of history uh, taking is uh, is uh, is something very unique and i've learned a lot in every single situations when i see expert clinician operating and i one of the things i picked up in the last 23 24 years is their way of taking history taking is something that I try to learn and replicate. And uh, the most important thing is, again, it's not only history taking. I think sometimes we hear, but we don't listen. Uh, so my way of doing it is I, I, I need to make sure uh, not only I'm hearing, but I'm listening to the patient as well. So by the end of subjective examination, before I go into my objective, my way of doing things is I do summarize whatever I listen her, heard and listened from the patients it two things it gives me it, it gives the confidence to the patient that the therapist is empathetic enough and uh, uh, to to at the same time they know that when they know you listen to their problem 80 percent of the time the clinical confidence for them thinking that you would be able to help them or unable to help them would become very clearer as i said earlier and at the same time when you listen to them you would be able to explain uh, things to them simply if if you are able to identify the source of the problem and I only use the physical examination to, to kind of complement my history and my uh, what is a subjective uh, decision making or, or, or hypothesis I have during my subjective decision, uh, subjective examination. I put a very interesting slide, slide here. Special tests aren't so special. I think sometimes as being orthopedic uh, physical therapist and sports physiotherapist, we do hang up quite heavily on special tests. We tend to think about, we, we try to remember what is Job's test, what is empty can test, what is full can test, what is belly press test, what is clunk test, what is biceps, uh, what is biceps overload test one, what is, bi what is uh, O'Brien's test. All these tests are in a symptomatic shoulder could be positive. So from that point of view, you cannot heavily rely on special tests to make come to a conclusive diagnosis as yet. And uh, one of the patient, uh, persons I follow very much is uh, Professor Jeremy Lewis, who is one of the very lead uh, uh, lead person in rotator cuff related shoulder pain. And he combined with uh, Dr. Paul uh, Salama in US and they did a review on looking at special tests and their reliability and validity in terms of uh, patient with rotator cuff pathology, and especially when they present to the clinic with, uh, with the diffused pain symptoms, and they were unable to locate or uh, say, uh, see, seen that the sensitivity and specificity of special tests are not great. So from that point of view, this is makes me lead to the, my next point. Uh, why MSK ultrasound as a point of care focus or point of care practice in, in physical therapy practice. Uh, in my experience, the ultrasound is as sensitive uh, as MRI if it's done by a good, uh, a good routine and a good uh, image optimization. And it gives you a clear diagnostic accuracy at one third of the cost of an uh, MRI. And at the same time, most of the shoulder pathologies that involves rotator cuff, and the subacromial uh, and, the, and the long head of biceps and pathologies can be identified by a good uh, sonographic examination. And also the real-time ultrasound gives very clear indications uh, to the patient that they are able to see what you are doing in front of the eyes to say that they are able to have a look at their structures in the shoulder real time on this point on the same time as you <laughs> examining them. From that point of view, when they see that you are able to explain the structures, you are able to visualize the structures, they are able to see the structural uh, pathology, uh, or if there is no pathology there, that, that gives a clinical confidence in terms of your treatment. So there's a better buy-in for the rehab process uh, followed by that. And it's accurate and reliable uh, with, with good uh, sonographic examination skills. And it's extremely reliable in identifying partial and full thickness tears of the rotator cuff involving supraspinatus subscapularis tendons. And often you don't see rotator cuff tear in the uh, in the infraspinatus and teres minor. So that's, uh, that's the uh, uh, reason why I use POCUS as a part of my examination. Uh, so it's an extension of your physical examination. It gives you more control as well as it's pain-free with no claustrophobia. And you can do dynamic examination when it comes to uh, impingement-related uh, symptoms. Uh, so from that point of view, 
uh, it is and it's it's easy and it's safe to transport and the patient can see what you're exactly doing. So is it evidence-based? Yes, it is. I'm not going to talk, read through a text that I already know in my experience in the last uh, three years uh, to four years, I have been using MSK US as a part of my uh, examination and I tend to get good buy-in as well as I am able to identify pathologies much more easily. Again, in, in this case, the key thing is always just correlate your image findings with the patient's symptoms. Please don't treat the image, please treat the patient, and please try to make sense of your image findings with the subjective examination. And with the image finding doesn't correlate with your subjective examination, then the image finding is, uh, is not relevant for your treatment or for your management. And that's very important to understand. I think one of the biggest mistake we do in sports medicine, elite sports medicine, is often people look at MRI scans and ultrasound scans, and we end up often treating the image uh, rather than treating the patient that is a human behind those images and the pain is a complex uh, in nature and pain related functional dysfunction is a complex in nature so your entire idea has to be treating the patient not treat the image uh, along with treating the pathology so again as i said msk us is as reliable as ultrasound when it's done properly with a good sequence and it is definitely advantages from a cost point of view portability point of view. There is no contraindications. With the modern machines, they are high resolution images you can produce, which, which shows tendon pathology a lot better than MRI, as well as dynamic uh, uh, loading. And you can also see when you load the tissue dynamically, you can see the disruption in the, in the tissue, even though it might look normal statically, but dynamically, there is either laxity or there is a micro tears that start visible when you put, tissue, put the tendon or ligament or structure you're viewing dynamically and you can add power doppler uh, to look at uh, if there is any localized inflammation or vascularity especially in in tendon pathologies and it's easy to repeat as a follow-up procedure so again here's a simple image of uh, rotator cuff tendon uh, using a dynamic ultrasound and you could see there is a full thickness tear uh, always when you do a, a scan you do it in two view two views when it's a longitudinal axis and when it's a short axis uh, that again as you as a part of msk ultrasound and just the examination of shoulder itself is a unique skill and uh, you can learn by uh, doing online courses as well as signing up to msk ultrasound courses again the partial thickness share with a good here also you can see the two view one is the longitudinal view another one is a is a short axis view you can see the substance tear, uh, partial thickness tear in the rotator cuff. And I'm not going to talk about uh, uh, what is a bursal tear to what is the, uh, what is the, uh, what is a pasta tear or partial attachment tears. Uh, that's not scope of this talk. Um, again, you can examine the acromioclavicular joint, which is one of the part of your shoulder, shoulder complex. So you can, uh, yeah. So you can have a look at uh, acromioclavicular joint. So, Again, using uh, ultrasound, you can look at uh, calcific tendinopathy. You can do percutaneous tenotomy use as a gated procedure. And uh, you can correlate the image of X-ray with an ultrasound to say it's exactly the calcifications you can see in uh, each part, in, in the exact area where you're looking. In, a, in an X-ray, you are getting a two-dimensional image, whereas in an ultrasound, you are getting still a, a close to a two-dimensional image, but a bit more, you are able to see the depth of the tissue where it is. Uh, in terms of uh, treatment. And you can have a look at uh, the biceps tendon using diagnostic ultrasound, and the tendon looks like a hyperechoic structure with a little bit of a normal fluid on the on the tendon is normal. But in this case, you could see there's a little bit of hypoechoic spots with a bit of a fluid around the tendon that tells you that there's a biceps tendon is undergone a bit of a degenerative changes. Again, I'm just going to uh, quickly whisk through uh, some thing that we see in sports medicine, which is actually throwing shoulder. I'm not going to talk too much about throwing faces. I've got a little video, the slow motion of throwing here for you to have a look at it. If you, if you look at this image, the throwing is a complex motion. It has to wind up uh, a yearly cock and a late cock and a release and a follow through action. And uh, this is my poor uh, uh, throwing technique. Uh, it could be better than, um, it could be better, but uh, just to, 
let you know how complex is throwing is. So when we talk about throwing shoulders, uh, the few things we screen in these patients is uh, there are a few concepts I want to discuss about. One is the total range of motion concept, which is an important concept to understand in any athlete with the overhead throw, overhead shoulder activity, because one of the things uh, adaptation of overhead uh, or a throwing activity is what we call there is two adaptations that happen uh, at the osseous level. One is the retroversion of the humeral head, and that can contribute to increased external rotation range with a limited internal rotation range often. Uh, without considering the osseous adaptation, often it can be mistaken for a, a glenohumeral internal rotation uh, deficit where the patient have an end physiological, uh, end anatomical block to the internal rotation movement. Often in these patients, these patients are often given sleeper stretches and extreme amount of internal rotation stretch, uh, stretches often lead to posterior cuff uh, uh, dysfunction as well as micro tear and uh, leads to reactive thickening of the posterior cuff. So it's very important to understand the concept of total range of motion. I'm sure uh, one of the panelists, uh, uh, Mr. Tariq, uh, who works with a lot of uh, tennis and badminton players would agree with this concept as he as he would look at this as a as a whole and i most of uh, thing when we screen uh, for throwers with um, with screening throwers with throwing problems we often bear in mind about total range of motion rather than uh, just a gird alone or you know, humeral internal rotation deficit alone so when you have a humeral uh, uh, torsion or retro torsion problem when there is not enough, to, to, not, there is not adequate torsion, you can develop in, in throwing shoulders, especially they can develop anterior shoulder insta instability. But when there's a torsion happens, it's more protective for the shoulder. That's the reason why some of the uh, uh, elite athletes with a good throwing uh, mechanism, they will have an, more than 140 degrees of external rotation. They might probably only have a 60 to 60 degrees or uh, uh, 65 degrees of internal rotation. In that case, they still will able to throw efficiently without uh, any pathologies in the shoulder. At the same time, one of the things out of experience I've seen is most throwing shoulders will have some amount of scapular dyskinesia. And this scapular dyskinesia, if you should evaluate is the dyskinesia is an adaptive uh, functional dyskinesia or it's a dyskinesia that's gone more than adaptive functional where it's going to lead to secondary pathologies in the shoulder or in throwing actions. So it's important to understand these two terms as well. Um, so posture and scapular position is very important. Understand about, I've already touched about uh, scapular dyskinesis as a part of your screening and look at the scapular humeral rhythm when you ask the patient to move dynamically standing behind the patient. patient. And always in the throwing shoulders, you have to understand the shoulders, th uh, the throwing shoulders is a, is a paradox. The throwing shoulder must be lax enough to allow excessive external rotation, but be stable enough to prevent symptomatic humeral subluxations that causes structural strain and leads to structural damage. So it is a very complex balance between mobility and stability. And this has uh, been uh, defined very well by uh, by Kevin Wilkes, who is one of uh, leading expert in uh, in baseball uh, thro shoulders. Uh, the throwing shoulders go through a lot of force. It's quite a high acceleration movement with 7,250 degrees per second uh, acceleration with anterior translation force close to one and a half times of your body weight. And at the time when you release the ball, the distraction is equal to the body weight in the deceleration pace with every rotator cuff muscle is working about 80 to 100 percent capacity of maximal voluntary cap uh, uh, capacity. So in this case, think about the exercises you're giving. Just the TheraBand exercises alone is not going to get your throwing shoulder problem. The throwing athletes need overhead sh shoulder strength as well as strength and conditioning as a part of their uh, management in a, in a very uh, specific way. So look at the history physical examination, range of motion assessment, bear in mind that total range of motion comp, uh, concept, as well as look at, uh, you can uh, what is it, advanced level measure the glenohumeral torsion using ultrasound and look at the motor uh, motor strength as well as stability and special strength and dynamic movement and look at the cervical sp the spine and the upper thoracic spine and you can put these athletes through performance testing to see where they are. So uh, I've been given a little nudge to say it's three minutes to wrap up so I'm just going to go through uh, as I said earlier look at the the common throwers will have a throwers, throwers laxity and that leads to osseous adaptation that leads to increased uh, retrotorsion and retrotorsion in throwing shoulder is a, is a, is a, 
it's an adaptive response and uh, when you need to bear that in mind and important to understand the muscles uh, strength deficits external rotations are often significantly weaker in throwing shoulders and they are stronger adduction and internal rotation wise and when you rehab the shoulders you need to at least gain 65 percent of the internal rotator strength uh, to your external rotators in order to develop good amount of uh, shoulder stability to prevent symptomatic uh, throwing shoulder uh, pain so i'm going to skip through a couple of so again, the throwing shoulder is multifactorial, impingement, laxity, instability, and labral pathology all can coexist at the same time. The molar active movement patterns can coexist. And in that case, think about when you're trying to problem solve the shoulder, it's very important for you to defragment it like you defragment when the computer gets slow and, uh, and uh, lethargic. And then you try to deal uh, the problems based on the presentations in front of your eyes. The rehabilitation consists of accurate diagnosis, specific goals and specific phases. Please don't have one set of exercise for all shoulder problems. And uh, it's important to think about pain relief in the acute phase and uh, think about strength and conditioning and progressive uh, return to throwing. So pain, break the pain cycle, pain functional restriction cycle. And you could manage the pain with pharmacological means using analgesics, non steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, stuff, physical therapy that includes, uh, you could use manual therapy and mobilizations, combine that with uh, uh, TECAR therapy, shockwave therapy, and uh, complex and neuromuscular electrical stimulation to re-educate uh, re the shoulder muscle group. And, uh, you know, in terms of calcific tendinopathies and uh, posterior capsular thickening, I find in, in sports medicine practice, um, shockwave is a, is a godsend uh, in terms of minimize or uh, reducing pain to a very significant amount to get the functional uh, rehabilitation started with the shoulder earlier. So I'm a big fan of uh, shockwave. Mostly uh, tend to use both radial and focal shockwave in in throwing shoulders and tecar therapy to combine with my manual therapy techniques to allow uh, twice the rehabilitation effects rather than try uh, doubling the treatment time in terms of. Uh, acute pain management and uh, improving the tissue flexibility and collagen extensibility and promote healing. And I do use K-tape, even though the evidence is flimsy. Patients do feel better. I do get some good uh, proper receptor effects through this. So um, I do use K-tape as a part of my practice. And again, sometimes simple taping, like a little lower trapezius taping that I shown in this patient, just that can alleviate uh, the shoulder uh, if, if you see the scapular dyskinesis between the left and right, you could uh, left and uh, left shoulder on the left picture and the right picture, you could see just simply reinforcing the, the facial tissue can uh, change the dyskinesis quite a bit. So again, I'm not going to go through too much into exercises. There are quite loads of exercises you can do and don't take one size fit all approach. And you can start from uh, open chain exercises to close chain exercises. And uh, and again, you can combine that with uh, dynamic exercises with uh, with TheraBand and, uh, and tube, tube, tube bands. Uh, and you can do scapular setting using TheraBand exercises. It's uh, one of my colleagues just demonstrating a simple lower trapezius uh, slash retra ret uh, retractus activation exercises. Uh, I'm going to take a couple more minutes, guys. Just going to skip through these videos. Um, and again, please always bear in mind, treat the kinetic chain along with treating the shoulder. And it's important to treat the kinetic chain. And uh, research suggests that throwing shoulder, uh, people with throwing shoulder problem will have contralateral hip abductor weakness. And it's one of the uh, thing I rehab in my, in my throwing athletes uh, during the mid to end stage rehab and focus on technique, focus on hip abductor uh, thing and uh, focus on good kind of hip pelvis uh, uh, rotation separation and use Swiss ball as a part of your core conditioning as well. And uh, I had the privilege of using Primus RS when I worked in Reliance Foundation Hospital. Often it's one of the uh, functional movement tool that you can use to strengthen with adding multiple dynamic resistances, but the machine is quite expensive. So from that point of view, if you don't have it, don't worry about it. But this is one of the tools you can use as a part of your rehab. Sorry, I'm a little bit rushed with regard to what I'm doing. Again, return to throwing involves throwing load monitoring, quality versus quantity, 
give a good pre-activation routine to your athletes and give a, give, give a good post-session recovery self, self-management self tool and also look at throwing workload management. Thank you very much. I hope I might probably gone through uh, one and sometimes you could put as simple as ta- tape as the one lower trapezius reinforcement tape I shown you. And in this big, strong athlete, I've actually gone with a heavy zinc oxide taping to just give him a bit of a proprioceptive feedback and uh, through his uh, what is this, shoulder complex. And again, this is again, we sometimes use heavy strapping in terms of when we deal with uh, rugby athletes. So any questions? I think uh, I'll stop my share now. And, uh, and uh, I hope, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm rushed a little bit, but uh, I hope I covered majority of the concept and uh, kept that uh, topic interesting. It was very interesting indeed. I guess uh, the most difficult job is to cover the shoulder in one top. I think it's unfair to give it just an hour and I can pretty well understand why, you know, you had to rush through the slides and I would have loved you to dwell, especially in those last few slides, you know. So maybe we should keep a part two for this, you know. Yeah, I think it, Yeah, <laughs> I think we should. So basically, thanks, Dr. Madan. That was really an enlightening talk. And uh, I do believe the concepts are changing. And I have noticed this in my clinical care that, uh, you know, the shoulder being the sling that it is, you know, the whole rotator cuff forming that circular shield or the semicircular shield, which you talked about, uh, does become, I mean, all the tests become positive when the, there's one, even one tendon which is inflamed, you know. So calling the special tests and relying totally on it um, is not becoming the right way forward. So we have to come up with alternative solutions to that. And uh, of course, even the core and what you talked about, you know, the gluteus of the opposite side being uh, intertwined and connected through facial connections to the shoulder uh, via latissimus dorsi is also a very important uh, uh, concept. I mean, the kinetic control talks all the time about it. So I guess uh, now I leave the session to the panelists to take it forward. So- I think just just to add one point, I think one of the one of the thing is see from a patient's point of view, the very important thing is patients want to be pain free quickly, yeah. and they want to get back and do what they want to do quickly. They don't care about how you achieve it, but this knowledge what we have is what allow us to uh, help them saying that when you get a shoulder pain, pain often. Is, is, a, is, a, is a late manifestation of a lot of dysfunction that building up over a period of time in the shoulder. Mm. And and often what we, as including myself, sometimes we fail to educate our patient is it is going to take time. It is going to, and it's a structured methodical approach to defragment exactly. and, and then and then deal with it. And and all of us will have some amount of personal experience with shoulder pain uh, yeah, in, in various had, degrees. If you remember. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Gaurish and uh, Dr. Gaurish, you may need to just unmute yourself. And Dr. Tariq, um, yeah, could you please join the panel? Was yes. Amazing talk, uh, Dr. Madan. It was really uh, this thing, the emphasis, what you put on assessment, it's very important because nowadays I have seen the young physios who are coming up, they focus on treatment, treatment, treatment. And this assessment skills, what are important, are uh, been spending time in history taking, assessing the patient is really important. And uh, that actually uh, needs to be emphasized. Dr. Any Tari. questions, guys? Yeah. Uh, so uh, you have been uh, also practicing U- USG guided injections in ultrasound. Uh, no, no, sorry, I, I'm not at practicing ultrasound guided injections. We need to be very clear with facts. <laughs> at this okay, stage, so, uh, I'm, I'm doing my postgraduate diploma uh, in uh, postgraduate certificate in MSK ultrasound, right. to consolidate my ultrasound skills so that I would be able to scan and report the scans properly through University of Brunel uh, right. here in uh, England. And right. uh, I'm expecting to complete the course by uh, May 2021. Uh, after that, when I, whenever I scan, I would be able to uh, hopefully just uh, report not hopefully I'll be able to report the scans properly and uh, and start building a, a common what's it building a encyclopedia of, uh, of good pathological images that I can in, I see in my clinic uh, ultrasound gated injections in UK 
through our uh, CSP network as well as Excentroscope Practice Network. Uh, the physios have picked up those skills and they started doing it as a part of their uh, clinic procedures here in UK. I'm not there yet. And at the same time, I'm, I'm uh, as much as I like injections as a quick short-term fix for pain relief, I'm not a big believer in injections, especially when it comes to intra-articular corticosteroids. So on that basis, I'm uh, sitting on the fence, but I might still pick up the skills in future to intervene in certain cases. But uh, my thing but is... Yeah, you, uh, you just to kind of put in, I guess uh, real-time ultrasound is also being used as rehab, not only for injections. I... You could you could as a, use as a rehab, but often what happens is if you started putting a probe on the patient's shoulder and try to rehab, you see here in, in our clinic, we get half an hour's time to treat the patient. And the half an hour time, the patient is paying serious amount of money to get uh, their pain addressed, get what they need to do to get tech home. So from that point of view, often we don't have the, in a sporting environment, we have the privilege of time. We can treat an athlete. Uh, we don't have a time limitation and we don't have a session limitations. I can see my cricketers twice a day if I, if I wanted to compared to in a, in a private practice environment, I can see a, a patient probably once a week. In some cases, if, you, if they're not very affordable, I may be only able to see them once a fortnight. So it's a, it's a balancing act, uh, if, you, if as, you, as you would understand. Uh, so I don't use uh, as a rehab tool. It, but your, your point Tariq, is valid. Uh, could we have some questions from you? Yes, just a moment. Um, yeah, can you hear me? Uh, could you hi, please hi, put yes, on Tarek. your video? Yeah. All right, all right. Yeah, yeah, we like to see you, Tarek. Madam, <laughs> Madam can, can you see me now? Because I'm not... Yeah. Oh, you, right. you look you look good, yes. mate. You look good. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. Madam, this was this was really a very, very good talk, but I had, I had something very important to ask you since you've worked so many years on and off field. Um, what is... I, I believe there are a lot of other physios who are also listening to this talk. What is... Uh, a common mistake or something you would see young physios and even physios of our age, we tend to overlook while we're practicing, which you either it's the shoulder joint or is it in general in practice, which you'd want to point out and say, all right, this is something you would really want to stress on. It could be a couple of them, but something that really strikes out. We, we, sometimes we don't listen to our patients. <laughs> Oh, that's 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 one point you that's, would really, really want to That's one point I've already emphasized. And the second thing is sometimes it, you, you, you don't know the answer to everything. So I accept your limitations. I, 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 to be honest with you, I go back to the slide by Albert Einstein. If you can't mm -hmm. explain something simply enough to your patients, you don't know what you're dealing with. And often are, uh, in, the, in the medical field, one of mm -hmm. the things as any medical professional we have is this mm -hmm. inbuilt ego. And that mm -hmm. ego is kind of a, a drive as well as a, 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 a distraction. And sometimes we tend to, uh, when things, when we get challenged, we tend to operate from our ego rather than tend to operate from, from the point of view saying, actually, there's a different points of view here that I need to, I don't know, I need to explore and learn more. So oh, I try not to, I all, yeah. another thing is I always say experience doesn't mean e equal expertise. Say I could be uh, experienced enough. Sometimes I may not have the expertise. I've seen some good young physios who, who have a very good clinical reasoning process, who pick up, who have good manual skills, who have good diagnostic skills and everybody develops skills. So always don't get into caught into the conundrum that experience means they are expert. expert. Expertise and mm -hmm. experience, just sometimes it, it combines together nicely when you're experienced mm -hmm. enough, but expertise mm -hmm. you can still develop if you open to learn and, and keep your mind open to learn. And that's there's just two contrasting uh, viewpoints. I mean, I would just like to know your opinion that whenever we pass through an acute phase, there's one school of thought which will tell you just rest it out for about a mm -hmm. couple of weeks and, you know, you can start rehab a little later. And there's a second uh, school of thought which believes, you know, start early on. So what have you seen in your practice which works better? My, my practice is, I think, rest has been prescribed in the 1960s to nine, uh, in, until 2000 quite heavily. And even until up to 2010, rest has been, it's an, it's an indication. See, you have to understand when a person go and see a GP uh, or a medical doctor, their way of managing pain is pharmacological and rest. So from their point of view, uh, give a good analgesics or anti-inflammatory and rest because they think that rest is, is protective. But as physios, we know that rest is rest, decrease the tissue capacity, decrease the ability of the tissue to load tolerate, makes the tissue become weak. And, and the, as soon as you start resting, you started uh, the protein uh, content of the, of the tissue that's involved decreases and the tissue become more vulnerable to, to exposure related injuries. So from that point of view, it's striking the balance between optimal rest to 
to uh, thing say in in a fracture thing you have to rest it you have to immobilize it but you can still keep the muscular system going by adding compacts uh, and using compacts to cre create isometric uh, contractions in in the muscular tissues that involve shoulder which many people won't do at the same time you can add cryotherapy to pain manage in some in some, so from that point of view just striking the balance between optimal rest to optimal activity so it's we, we speak about this concept of optimal loading and it's a lovely term optimal loading but nobody knows what is optimal loading for what person what is optimal loading to sona is different to what is optimal loading to tarik to what is optimal loading to sachin tendulkar to what what is optimal loading to virat kohli you know it the 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 ability of the person to tolerate load is different and it's it's in all fairness load load management is a trial and error process exercise prescription is a trial and error process not one exercise will, will work but yeah. our, our our assumptions are we think we can load manage by having a fixed formula we can exercise prescribe prescribe having a fixed formula we can workload monitor having a fixed formula it's never that fixed it's it's a complex uh, interactions with multiple factors i hope i answered your question on that one yes yes you did in fact not a big fan of protocols myself sometimes it you know you just need it to be tailor made you know yeah one more thing to add to the point when tarik mentioned about uh, physios uh, especially coming from subcontinent i think one thing our physios tend to do is we tend to we we tend to base recipes our physios back in in, in the subcontinent like recipe based approach they say sir i don't want to know this mere ko ye pata nahi i need mere ko kuch de jiye main aise leta hu patient ko apply kar deta hu wo patient theek ho jayega wohi wohi chahiye mere ko i hope my hindi is good when i say this but and, and if it's in, in it's the same same mentality that goes from north to south east to west in in india very few young even uh, when i had our uh, lectures last time and that's one thing we could commonly yeah. see yeah sorry to interrupt i guess uh, it's really time to wrap up i am getting some nudges from dr i mean from rahul sir so i guess uh, i'm very Please. sorry i that we have to end the session it's really would have been a great thing to just carry this forward with all the experts here who could have given their uh, you know tiny uh, gems of wisdom as far as uh, treating the shoulder is concerned and it's indeed complex and i think it can go on as you said for an hour more if we want to talk about it but just to wrap it up i thank all the panelists as well as uh, dr madan from the entire physio tv family and uh, yes dr madan i think we need a one more talk on the complex shoulder i think we need the uh, part 2 of it and uh, i guess we are coming back to you to ask you for it very soon so on that That's note uh, a very big big thank you from the entire physio tv family and thank you signing off thanks a thank lot you. thank, thank you so much thank you, much. Thank you uh, madam thank, thank you guys thank you so much nice meeting you all thank you bye. likewise take care bye bye yeah. Yes bye, Gaurish we we'll meet sometime soon yeah. take care take care ma'am bye bye very soon we'll be inviting talks from you also yeah <laughs>